Hey everyone, Eric Watson here, freelance writer, player of games, writer of words, recorder of videos, online role-playing aficionado. With this video, I will be reviewing the DM's Guild adventure, The Amulet of Shavaka, designed by Phil Beckwith for Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. This adventure is included in the DM's Guild bundle adventure anthology of PB Publishing. And PB Publishing has provided a review copy for the purposes of this review. So The Amulet of Shavaka is a self-contained one-shot dungeon adventure. It tasks the PCs with exploring a mummy's undead filled tomb at the edge of a desert. It's designed for a party of level 2 PCs uh, with encounter adjustments for levels 1 through 3 and has an estimated playtime of 4 to 6 hours. So the beginning story hook is pretty much as basic as they come. A uh, character named Elil uh, seeks out the PCs based on stories that they've heard. Uh, although the PCs are level 2, so I'm not sure <laughs> how famous uh, their stories can be at this point. Uh, this NPC is sent to retrieve an amulet from the tomb of Shavaka, so he knows the location, knows that the amulet isn't there. However, he doesn't want to go inside for obvious reasons that will soon become clear. Uh, this character is just kind of a blank cipher. There's no real information on him or his master or any kind of motivations. It is literally just a like character approaches your party and says go retrieve this item from this dungeon and I'll pay you this much money which is pretty much as basic a dungeon hook as you can get which is fine it, that can we can work with that um, but it's very very light on uh, story in that way but it does make it easy to slot it in particularly since it's pretty much a self-contained inside the one dungeon uh, you can kinda just drop in this dungeon wherever you want in your campaign as long as the kind of you know mummy desert kind of Arabian Nights theme uh, fits which as a side note I think I love the Arabian Nights theming um, and I don't get enough of that from you know especially from the official 5th edition campaign adventures it's all been very either high fantasy or they've touched on gothic stuff we've done like the underdark we've not really done any kind of cool desert uh, adventures so I think this is kind of a neat uh, miniature look into that. So the adventure begins in earnest once they enter the tomb of Shavaka, which the tomb itself consists of two levels of 14 rooms, so it's pretty pretty good size. We can go ahead and skip down to the map right here, which is unfortunately not the most attractive map ever. It gets the job done, but as somebody that again plays on Roll20, I would not be able to use this at all. Basically just the basic graph paper map. Um, but it's a pretty, pretty decent sized dungeon for a, uh, what is mostly a one shot, although it's very combat heavy, which leads me to think that it would actually take probably two sessions of about three hours each to get through. Uh, and it's, you know, it's got several locked doors, there's a few traps, but it's mostly, like I said, it's combat heavy. It's rooms full of zombies and skeletons, very uh, kind of straightforward and linear, in fact has locked doors where you need to, like, beat certain enemies in order to get the key to unlock to the next stage, very... Uh, old school video gaming in that way. One of the coolest features the dungeon does is triggered right at the entrance, which you can see on this right side is the uh, King Story Hallucinations. This is fantastic. Essentially, the PCs step on a pressure plate and that releases gas from the walls. And instead of doing like damage, although I guess it has a chance to what does it do? Disorientation, suffer disadvantage. You roll a d6 and everything's happen. If it's a two through five, the good thing happens, which is um, they become infected by these hallucinations. They do get a saving throw. It's a... what is this saving? DC 13 constitution saving throw to resist those effects, and then if they're infected by the hallucinations, every room they enter, you're supposed to get a, I think, DC 15 wisdom saving throw. I don't like that this is put down to saving throws, because I think these are so cool that I would want to do these regardless, which is very similar to how... Um, Phil did the uh, the haunt adventure in that he just kind of it was like a cutscene like you moved in and just saw these ghostly figures happening and that kind of told the story and was really immersive and cool. I want to do the same thing here. Don't leave that up to a saving throw, especially two saving throws, even if they're kind of tricky for level two. Maybe you could do the first one because you technically only need like one character to fail it in order to uh, have the scenes, and that could maybe something your players could work with is the fact that only like maybe one or two of them are actually seeing these scenes. But the scenes themselves are really cool. It's like you're learning about the the mummy king and essentially like how he came to power and these dark rituals that took place where he kind of sucked the essence out of his followers 
Also, how he dies and how he was mummified are all these different sections. Really, really cool scenes. I love this a lot. It is a great way to make this otherwise uh, not at all story uh, intensive scene have some really cool uh, just kind of cutscene moments that really set the stage and, and bring this dungeon to life. So I would recommend uh, absolutely doing those. Bare minimum, take away the second saving throw and maybe even the first one if you really want to have them make sure they happen, but they're really cool. Um, other than that, the dungeon mostly consists of just kind of moving room to room and and killing a bunch of undead. There's literally a room of skeletons that you know, awaken at some point. There's a room of zombies that awaken at some point. <laughs> Which, by the way, you know, the third or fourth time you're going to unleash this on your players, they're they're just going to assume whatever dead bodies are in a room are just going to wake. <laughs> Especially, and I guess I'll get to that final boss, but, like, the final boss is like a mummy kind of slumped over, and it's like, surprise, he's awakened, it's the King of Pocket. Like, that's not a surprise. Like, come on. <laughs> the, the players are going to assume every single dead body in here is out to kill them once you... You know, you can only get away with that trick, like, once. And yet it keeps going on. Um, but yeah, there's just there's rooms of zombies, rooms of skeletons. There is a mini-boss of sorts in a zombie priest, which is kind of a unique uh, stat block, although I think it's mainly just a strong zombie armed with a mace. Um, but it does have a crap ton of hit points, I noticed. Uh, and then you'll get the key from the zombie priest, which lets you move on to the second level. So the first level... You know, again, if you're not doing those hallucinations, there's just not much going on. You're just fighting a bunch of undead in each room. So I would really recommend doing those hallucinations because they are nifty. And the second level is detailed in Chapter 3, which is the, I guess, just the inner part of the tomb. And here, the uh, relic you're after, the amulet, is seen, but it's got, like, this force field around it, so they can't get to it. And instead, it spawns a Plague of Soul Locust, which is the other cool thing that this uh, dungeon does. Essentially, every room they enter in the second level, you roll a d20, and on a 10 or above, so basically so a 50% chance, they will be attacked by uh, Soul Locust. It just says 1d4, but I would always unleash a bunch, because, you know, one or two, nobody's going to be afraid of one or two bugs. you got to have a Plague of Soul Locust. And they are more like a trap hazard instead of an actual combat encounter. They they just kind of surprise, attack, try to get their hit off. If they do, they steal a maximum hit point off a hero and then attempt to escape using their, like, 40 fly speed or whatever into the final boss room and actually transfer those hit points to the boss. That's a really cool effect. I'm not sure if your players would realize that's what was going on. Maybe if there was some way to telegraph the fact that they're sucking out, like, this green energy out of the heroes and, like, maybe they glow green and, and fly off to the final boss and then, uh, you know, you can say something like he's strengthened from the heroes. I don't know if they'll actually ever get that off, and again, you might only ever even see, like, two different plagues happen, given, you know, how many times they have to enter rooms. Uh, and like, they only have, like, a plus four or five to hit, I guess we can go ahead and look up that information. That's a plus five. Um, and then, yeah, a flying speed of 40, and then all they do is that one hit point. But it's, it's a neat thing to kind of harass the party and make them feel like maybe there's, like, even a time limit, or in some way the final boss is, like, harassing them, which is a, a neat thing to do, I think. So that's it's a it's a neat way to to make a kind of ongoing uh, dungeon hazard without being too deadly. I mean, this is these are level two dungeons. So you really can't do anything too crazy or too dead. I mean, unless you want to make it too deadly. And I think it does mention that it's supposed to be challenging, which almost everything you know you see on DMs Guild they're always going to say challenging because you know if you want to use anything, it's going to end up really being challenging for low level players. Low level D and D, you are super weak. Um, so let's see, we go, and it's just kind of more of killing things, there's a room full of skeletons, more skeletons this time, uh, Death's Door has a nice little, so there's two neat scenes that I think both are missing handouts, I would have liked to see actual player handouts used here, both for if you're doing it in, you know, a real tabletop, or if, uh, like me, where you're doing Roll20 and you actually can give your players, like, a digital handout, but one of them is this Ritual of Shavaka, which is a book that you find that is supposed to explain kind of, you know, what happened. I guess that's just in... It's, it's a book that I think this adventurer has, and this adventurer caused the problem of kind of reawakening this uh, king as well as bringing the amulet back. Um, but it's not... It's it's not even like you read this part of the book. It's like you have to summarize this, which I don't like as a, as a DM. Like, give me... Give, give me these paragraphs of, like, here's what you have to say. Like, here's what the book says. 
And uh, that would I think that would go the extra miles if you actually make it like this nice little handout of this like book excerpt that has that information in there, which would be really flavorful and cool. And again, a way to kind of dive into that immersion. Uh, the other one is you see a plaque at one point. I think it's over this skeleton room. Uh, and you see what is essentially ends up being a passcode you have to use for the final uh, to get to the final door uh, without the doors like slamming shut on everybody is uttering this passcode which is neat I like that you just have to kind of pay attention to what's that one there it is my life is your privilege and your death is my right and it's kind of and this one is written out to where it's part of the description of the room but I would have liked to have that an actual handout you show the players because I think that is what would trigger the fact that they need to remember this like this is an important thing for them to remember like an actual usable piece of intel and not just flavorful text. Uh, so I would have liked to see those as handouts. Uh, the finale is kind of anticlimactic. Again, level two, you can't do too much to your poor players, especially because this is very combat heavy. You've thrown a lot of, of undead at them. But it's just its a little disappointing. The mummy, Shavaka, is just a normal mummy. There's a stat block at the end that says King Shavaka, but as far as I can tell, and I looked at the monster manual, it's the exact same as a normal uh, mummy. So... There's nothing really special about him. There's nothing special about the final room in terms of hazards or traps. He's simply like, uh, and it literally doesn't even come to life until they're supposed to be well into the room, which, okay, fine. But again, your players are going to know what's up. <laughs> Oddly, there is, there's a secret room just beyond, behind him. Uh, you can see up here where it says, uh, let me see my mouse back. There we go. Um, the secret room right here, which holds like two more mummies, like his consorts, I guess, which they're supposed to be weaker. They don't have the hit points that he does. I think he's supposed to be, you know, average hit point mummy, which is like 60, and they have like 30-something. But still, two mummies is way more difficult suddenly than one mummy. It's all about action economy, and that's a big thing about balancing d d is even if you have, to an extent, a tough boss, if they're only going once around and your players are going in four or five times around, that's a big balance of power shift. And, you know, especially down to the dice. You know, yeah, he can get a hit off and, and down somebody, and it can be awful, but he's just got that one chance to hit. So having two mummies, that just completely doubles their power. So if you think about it like that, that would honestly be would be the tougher fight. And you, I don't think you want to have a tougher fight than your big boss fight. So something I would like to see is maybe he like retreats and opens the door and two more mummies pop out or something crazy. Like that could add to the climax. But I, I, I don't know how strong. I've never used mummies before. And again, level two, like it, that does get a little dicey to use that. But I think there could have been some, some method... And something Phil's done well in the past is explain how exactly a fight breaks down in terms of round per round. Obviously, this one's not very complicated. It's just one uh, enemy, and it's just a mummy. But I think that would have been a cool moment, is maybe he retreats, summons his two consorts, they come out attack. Maybe he retreats and, like, hides and lets them come out and attack, so it's more of a balance. But there could have been something more, I think, just fighting, like, a straight-up mummy fight. Um, and then the, f the final loot box is has two different traps on it, which <laughs> this is... I just thought this was kind of stupid because, like, you know, uh, you're not going to get this chest unless you defeat the boss, and then after you've defeated the boss, you've essentially completed the adventure, so it's it's almost like you're, you're not quite pulling out of the adventure and just doling out stuff, but that's essentially what ends up, at least in my group, is you're just like, all right, let's dole out the loot, let's dole out the experience, you know, it's just kind of the end of the session thing. So to suddenly, like, make people roll these skill checks and inflict damage and traps on them just feels really strange because it's like, wow. Why are you going to do that to them when the danger is past? I don't know, you know, are you teaching your players, like, oh, no, you need to be in a heightened sense of awareness at all times, which, okay, but it just feels weird. It just feels a very strange way of, like, doling out this loot at the end. It's like, oh, and ha-ha, you take some other damage. Everybody's like, okay, but I guess we'll just go rest now because we're done. You know, it, I, I don't know. It's it, if, if there's a chest in the middle, you know, if there's treasure in the middle of the dungeon, absolutely trap that shit. Like, you know, make your players work for it. But at the end, I feel like they've already done the work. Um, unless somehow your players, like, sneak past the mummy or whatever, but that's, that's they can't complete the adventure unless they destroy him, so I don't I don't know. And then the, uh, the amulet itself is literally just a MacGuffin. Like, it has no... Unlike, so it's very similar to The Haunt, where which is another adventure found in the uh, uh, Adventure Anthology by PB Publishing, in that there is an evil artifact that is causing all these problems, and in, in defeating the big bad, it shuts off the artifact. However, in that adventure, you actually recover the artifact, and it has full, like, stats and information on it in a whole separate page. This one does not have any of that information, it, and it literally just says, Note, the amulet is now powerless, having lost its power with the destruction of the mummy of... Shavaka. So it does nothing. It is literally just a dead weight in your hand. So all you do is turn it into the uh, quest giver at the beginning for your payout. So it just seems a little 
disappointing. Um, I mean, granted, most players are just going to hand it over anyway, but it would have been nice if there had at least been that extra information about, like, okay, what happens if they actually want to keep it or study it? Or, you know, maybe you've got a hero whose flaw is, like, I'm super covetous and into magical items, even dark ones. You know, that could be a neat uh, a neat hook for them to, to look into it. So a little disappointed is not information on it. But, you know, overall, it's... It's fine. It's very straightforward. It seems very easy to run. Like, there's no real complications um, that you have to keep track of. Uh, it's just... One thing to note is it is very undead heavy, obviously, which is fine. That's the theme and the flavor. And, and I like that it makes sense. You know, it's it's as, like, mummy, former followers, and skeletons, if you find that dead adventure. So there's a nice, like, story to be told contextually, which is good. Um, just be aware that, like, a team with... Or a, a party with a you know, cleric and paladin or spellcasters with fire spells are going to do very well as opposed to a party that has, say, like a poison-focused fo- druid or uh, any, or like an illusionist, like wizard or sorcerer who like wants to like sleep people or make illusions, which undead don't give a shit about that. So that's not, you know, it's not the fault of the adventure. I just want to make a note of that if you're thinking about running this in your campaign, um, that it is very much 100% undead. And certain, you know, it's one thing to introduce a challenge in that way. It's another if one or more of your player characters feel literally completely useless. I just think that's not like fun for them. But it could be, you know, if that's if you want to challenge your, maybe you're really pissed off because your wizard, your level two wizard player is super powerful and knocking everything out, and you're like, aha, well here's an undead dungeon. So you know, you be you. <laughs> All right. Um, Final pros, quick pros. Uh, the King's Story hallucinations are very well written and a great way to immerse the PCs into the history and story of the tomb. Let me go back to the top here. Uh, I just, I really love those and I would not leave them up to a uh, series of saving throws. I would absolutely use them. I also enjoyed the Plague of Soul. So that, and that was like the first area. And then the second area, the Plague of Soul Locust, which I thought was also a neat way. Uh, this one is less story focused, but just a, an a interesting way to harass the PCs as kind of an ongoing dungeon uh, trap that I would definitely try to use at least twice uh, during that adventure. Uh, cons: the map is just bare bones, black and white graph paper with little to no detail. Like, yeah, it shows you the map, but of all the adventures I've looked at in the uh, adventure anthology by PB Publishing, this might be the single worst map that I've seen in terms of just pure what it gives you from a visual standpoint. I think I've got the image. There we go. Uh, it's just not attractive at all. I would not want to use this in any way, shape, or form. Just not not a good map. I don't like it. <laughs> uh, con, the adventure has at least two pieces of information that could have used proper player handouts, as I mentioned earlier. Um, that ritual book, which is just kind of summarized instead of you know fully written out, which could have been just... Uh, it, it would have been a nice way to f- uh, uh, immerse players again instead of just summarizing it. And as somebody reading this adventure, I like it when more information is given that flavor text, and then I can choose whether to use that flavor text or just summarize it. Uh, otherwise, if you give it to me summarized, then I have to do the work of like putting it in the handout and putting the flavor text on it if I want to do it that way. Uh, and also that plaque with the passcode, I think that would have been very... And I think that's a better way of making the players realize, oh, this this uh, phrase on the plaque is actually important for us to remember and is actually a key phrase to use later in the dungeon. Also, another con, the final confrontation with Shavaka just feels kind of uh, anticlimactic as written, just kind of just a single regular mummy fight in a room. Uh, and he doesn't even speak at all. There's no little villainous monologuing or anything. It's just kind of you fight him and that's it. So just a little, a little anticlimactic. Uh, for my taste. But the verdict, uh, the Amulet of Shivaka provides an effective low-level dungeon crawl filled with a gauntlet of undead battles. Thank you to everyone for watching this video review. You can see my written review at roguewatson.com. You can follow our own tabletop adventures here on my YouTube channel. Thank you.